I'll fix this up here and draw you a little map. Let's come on down here. We draw the coastline down through Atlantic City, on down here to Wilmington, Myrtle Beach, on down the coast very crudely. We're flying along out here somewhere. We've got an Omni radio station here in Atlantic City. We've got another one here at Norfolk. And we've got another one down here at Myrtle Beach. So we tune in this station here. And on our little dial window I showed you a minute ago, it says that we bear from that station, say, 300 degrees. Well, we draw a line of 300 degrees magnetic true bearing right through that station, which extends out here somewhere. We are somewhere along that line, but where? Okay, so we tune in this next station down here. And that one says in the little window that we have got a bearing of, say, 260 degrees. So we draw a line through that station at 260 degrees true. And where those two lines cross, that is where we are, right there. A little snooze, a few hours have gone by, and we are now approaching Miami. Now we'll show you what takes place in our approach, in our landing. Time for us to start a gradual descent. But first, we have to get clearance to approach. Richard? Miami Tower from Eastern 601, 10 miles north. Eastern 601, 10 miles north at 11. Make left turn in runway 17, wind south 10, altimeter 2998. Let's have about 60% flaps. Maps coming 60. Gear down. Gear's coming down. Captain will reverse the pitch of the propellers and push the air forward and just stop the plane. There. You see, that acts as a powerful brake. So next time when you're riding in an airliner and you hear the engines roar soon after you're on the ground, remember that's what he's doing, reversing the props to stop the airplane. schedule. I hope you folks enjoyed this as much as we did. Of course, this was purely and strictly a routine flight with beautiful weather. But maybe we've been able to show you some things you hadn't seen before. But you know, I'll bet you right now some of you are saying, well, sure, this was nice. It was lovely weather. But what happens when the weather is bad? Well, believe me, it's still routine. You see, in the first place, up where these super connies do most of the flying, the weather's always nice, way up on top of all the bad weather. Usually, it's only on approaches to our airports that weather becomes any problem, and then not much. As long as we have a half a mile of visibility and 200 foot of ceiling, no problem at all. 
Now, these minimums are arbitrarily set up by the Civil Aeronautics Administration in the interest of general safety. Actually, we can land one of these airplanes when the minimums are zero, zero. Let me show you. Here we are flying on instruments. We're in the clouds. It's one of those nights that the birds aren't even walking. We have been cleared to make an instrument approach. We have been cleared to the outer marker. This point we call the outer marker is located approximately five miles from the end of the runway. A light flashes on the cockpit panel. At the same time, the ADF needle indicates the passage of the marker, and we also get an audio signal. At this point, the glide path is intercepted. The glide path is a sloping radio beacon down which the aircraft should make its descent to the runway and is indicated by the horizontal needle. When the needle is centered, the aircraft is on the glide path. If the needle moves above center, the aircraft is low and must climb back to the path. If the needle is below center, we're high on the glide path. This is a big help in itself. But in addition to the ILS, the instrument landing system, we have GCA, that is ground control approach. And that can give additional valuable assistance. Radar monitoring on uh, localizer voice as you approach the outer marker. By means of this radar, the GCA controller sees the approaching plane as a bit of light moving on his scope and can direct it safely to the airport. When the flight has been directed to the approach course, it is turned over to the radar monitor for final approach. Radar to Eastern, you're approaching the ILS course. Turn to a heading of 247, and I'm turning you over to the radar monitor for final approach. This is radar monitor. Etched right on the scope is both glide path and localizer, and any deviation can be detected and measured in feet. You are four miles from the end of the runway, 200 feet to the right, of course, but correcting nicely. Your glide path is good. You are three miles from the end of the runway. Your course is good. Glide path slightly low, but okay. You are two miles from the end of the runway. Your course is good. You're now approaching the middle marker. You're over the middle marker. The approach light should be coming into view. Approach lights in view. Thank you, GCA. That column of lights ahead shows the approach to the end of the airport runway. Each bar of light is 100 feet apart, and that ball of light traveling away from us at such a high rate of speed is leading us right to the approach end of the runway itself. The green lights mark the start of the runway, and the border lights on each side stretching out into the distance outline a mile and a half of airstrip just waiting for us to land on. So you see, it really isn't too difficult. Actually, we use these landing aids every day in good weather and bad to keep in practice. And practically all of the airports that we use are equipped with them. The thing to remember is that it's all figured out. Nothing is guesswork. It's still routine. Now I'm going to show you the most amazing demonstration of power in an airplane you've ever seen. Let's go back upstairs. Now watch this. Feather one. Feather one. Feather two. Feather two. Look at that, on two engines, purring along just like a kitten. You haven't seen anything yet. Feather three. Feather three.
boy, oh boy, look at that. On one engine. Going along just as steady as you like. Only a constellation can do this. Why do we have all that tremendous reserve of power? Because, my friends, power means safety. That's why this super constellation is the most dependable airliner in the world today. OK, Hugh, bring in one. Unfeathering one. These engines are not only the best that money can buy, but they are maintained by the finest bunch of aviation mechanics in the world, trained for years by Eastern. You know, you can have the best captains and the best pilots in the world, but they can't do much good if the engines don't run. We've got the best mechanics in the business in Eastern. Doesn't that inspire confidence? I think it does. dreams, I guess. I never did aspire to own an airline, but I always wanted an airplane of my own, even when I was a kid. I've got two of them now, a DC-3 and a Navion, and there are thousands of privately owned airplanes all over America today. This is the little airport or landing strip that I use when I fly home to Virginia. That's my Navion coming in there, a single engine plane. We can go most anywhere in it. It has all the technical facilities and instruments that the big planes have. Besides the Navion, I have a DC-3. That's my Air Force. We call this little field the Leesburg International Cow Pasture. out there give a hundred octane milk. Of course, these are reciprocating engines here. We have the regular jet engines like we use in our military aircraft. This is a Lockheed F-94C Starfire. It's an Air Force jet-propelled fighter. You see, these jet engines, contrary to what I'm afraid is too popular a belief, are not the lethal things they're cracked up to be. As a matter of fact, they're so quiet and so vibrationless that to ride behind one of them is a real comfort. We're hoping someday soon that our commercial transports will be jet propelled. You see, a jet engine has no propeller. The air is drawn in through the intake ducts just forward of the wings compressed and mixed with burning fuels to produce a powerful jet of exhaust gases which are expelled aft. The mechanism involved in reality is much simpler. The propeller is replaced by an air compressor. There's a combustion chamber into which we inject fuel to expand the air and increase its velocity and installed in the path of the exhaust gases is a turbine to drive the compressor. There you have it. This is my friend Tommy Daniels, a member of our Air Forces for 12 years. Tommy is one of the thousands of fine young men who are making a career out of the Air Force, taking advantage of the wonderful training they receive. How do you like it, Tommy? It couldn't be better, Mr. Godfrey. It's really wonderful. Now I'm going to have the pleasure of flying with Tommy today in some very exciting scenes. So, Tommy, what are we going to do? Well, Mr. Godfrey, I'd like to take you through some pull-ups 
to show you just what this airplane is designed to do in climbing to altitude rapidly. I'm sure you'll enjoy it, but it's just routine flying to us. We do it every day. Now, before we take off, I would like to have your friends take a look at the afterburner in the tail section. It gives this airplane this terrific wallop. Okay, Tommy, we'll do it. This Lockheed Starfire is an all-weather Air Force interceptor. She was designed especially to get off the ground quickly and climb to altitude very quickly in the hope of being able to intercept and stop any enemy bombers that might come over this way. To help her get up there quickly, she was designed with this afterburner in the tail section, which is why this tail section is so much bigger than any other jet you've probably seen. See, there's an auxiliary engine back in here that uses exhaust gases as they pass through and reburn them with greater efficiency, giving additional thrust to the engine. That really is something to watch and get off quickly and climb to altitude, boy, oh boy. I want to show you what I mean, so we're going to fly by first on the regular jet, and so you can see and hear how it performs. And then we're going to fly by with the afterburner on. And you'll hear that, well, you'll see for yourself. You just watch. OK, Tommy, let her go. Watching you now on straight jet. Watch our rate of climb. Now we are approaching with the afterburner in operation. Watch the increase in this climb. How'd you like it, Mr. Godfrey? <laughs> Boy, my pants are where my necktie ought to be. But it was wonderful. Gee, what a dive. Woo! That's just a sample of what this airplane can do, Mr. Godfrey. Thank you, Tommy. And this airplane can do much more, as we're going to see. Yes, and here comes the man now who's going to do it. And here is the chief test pilot for Lockheed, my good friend, Tony Levick. Hello, Arthur. It's good to see you. Well, if you think those pull-ups were something, Arthur, just watch and I'll show you how easy it is to penetrate the sound barrier with this airplane. I wasn't with Tony on this flight, but we have a camera specially rigged on the tail to give you a close-up view of what happens when you break the sound barrier. Let me tell you what to watch for. First, notice the deep color of the sky, how much darker it is at 45,000 feet where Tony will start his dive. You are not only far above the clouds, but also above the haze and dust of the lower atmosphere. You are looking at the pure ultraviolet rays of outer space. There's the peel off. Now listen as the sound builds up. Usually, there are two thunderclaps. One, when the plane runs away from its sound, and the second, when the sound catches up again. Between the two, you are flying faster than the speed of sound and it is absolutely silent. Now the sound is building up. The sound barrier has been broken. This is the silence of supersonic flight. Now the pullout is being made. Listen to the noise when the sound catches up. You folks have just seen some very spectacular flying. But the point I'd like to make to you is this, that as spectacular as it looks, it's not foolhardy, not without purpose. This airplane was built to take that kind of a strain. I'll say it was, Arthur. You know, even when you're flying faster than the speed of sound, 
this business of flying in our air forces is carefully figured out to the last detail. We take nothing but calculated risks. Calculated risks, you know? Our equipment is the very best. It's built to fly. You wouldn't make dives and pullouts like that with a transport plane that wasn't built to do that. This kind of an airplane was. While we were climbing up out of that dive there at the rate of about 45,000 feet a minute for a few seconds. Even our big bombers, the B-52, the B-47s, they fly so fast, and yet they're built to fly strong, and have all the bugs been worked out of them. So that really, it, it isn't something spectacular, this business of flying so fast. It's done every day. By personnel, it's trained very carefully by men who are competent to train the youngsters coming along. Your son that joins the Air Force or the Naval Air Service, never fear but what he'll get the very best possible instruction that every precaution will be made to look out for his safety. Sure, there's danger to it. There's danger to crossing the street. It takes a special breed of cat to fly these things. This, this can't be done by any namby-pamby. That's why all the men you know who are pilots are such wonderful young men. You young fellas looking for adventure, looking for real life, something you love every minute of it, you go and see the nearest Air Force recruiting officer or the nearest Naval officer procurement station or the nearest air station someplace. Talk to them about it. It's a wonderful life. You love the years that you spend there. And you'll use the experience all the rest of your days. Join up. We need you. So now let's get back to the man who knows most about where air transportation is going. Hello, Art. Well, Rick, we've told the story pretty good up to now, I think. What would you say we can look forward to in the next few years? Well, Arthur, you've been talking about jets. You know, it won't be long until we'll be flying from New York to Miami in a matter of two hours, San Francisco in five, and to London in five to five and a half hours, and at altitudes from 35,000 feet to 45,000 feet. In fact, we'll be landing and taking off in most any kind of weather. Well, that's fine. That's wonderful, Rick. Our planes are flying faster all the time. But what are we going to do about this business of getting from the airport to town and from town to the airport? Doggone, sometimes it takes you longer to do that than it does to fly where you're going. I know. And we're going to be doing something about that, too, Arthur. It won't be long until you'll be going to your midtown terminal. There you'll step into an express elevator and be whisked to the top of the building. There are a commodious helicopter be awaiting to take you baggage and all and deposit you at the main airport in just a matter of minutes. And not only from downtown, Arthur, we're going to have feeder lines of helicopters coming in from all the surrounding communities. We're going to make flying better and faster. We're going to make flying available to still more people. Well, Rick, it's been a lot of fun. A rare privilege and a great honor to do this with you. I've learned a lot, and I hope we've done some good. I'm sure of it, Arthur. Good luck. God bless you always, Captain Godfrey. Thank you, Ray. Well, it was a real nice trip, kid. Captain Dick Merrill, it was a rare privilege to fly with you today. Well, Arthur, I couldn't have been with a better captain. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen and Helen, for a very pleasant trip. You, you, Palmer, the grand flight engineer. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Captain. Grand trip. So remember, when you want to fly anywhere in the world, call Eastern Airlines. If one of our planes doesn't go where you want to go, we'll put you on one that does. And I'll be seeing you, be the good Lord willing. <laughs>